and again, he he would say if if he was asked why he did it, and you think about the circumstances, you know, there there they are, they're flying at altitude in the mountains and at the Chosen Reservoir, in North Korea. Uh, it's you know, 40 below zero at night, snow and ice. Uh, you know, um, the American troops on the ground are outnumbered 10 to 1 by North Korean and Chinese uh, soldiers. Um, so just incredibly challenging, oppressive conditions, and and there are the Navy pilots, um, you know, flying support for the Marines on the ground, and and you know Jesse gets shot down, and <laughs> Dad, you know, Dad decides to do a wheels up landing, uh, you know, on the side of a mountain in snow and ice, um, and if he did process it, uh, you know, certainly would have would have realized pretty quickly that he had very little chance of survival himself. And but again, his his response was, you know, he was, you know, just <laughs> just doing his job. And uh, if if he hadn't done it, somebody else would have. Um, he said that if. Um, you know, certainly Jesse would have done the same for him. But in his mind, it was just sort of a matter of course, and that's what, <laughs> you know, that's what so many men and certainly thereafter women were, were doing, um, touting his own story, um, you know, if part of that message was that it was a common type of act, you know, that was, I think, a, a significant message. Looking back on it, now what I remember is there was a lot of freedom after World War II, but it took a it took a couple of years before the country uh, settled down and resumed its earlier position. When I got my wings in the fall of 1949, um, we didn't know what kind of life we we're going to live. And then Korea came along on the 26th of June. It was a completely different world. The attack on South Korea by the North came as a complete surprise to anybody. We were very, very fortunate to be able to hold them off. But if we'd lost all of Korea, it would have changed the nature of everything in that part of the world, and it would have had its effect on the rest of the world, too. I think it was the 28th of November that they, the Chinese came into the war. And right immediately, the troops on the ground needed every bit of support we could. With all of the troops coming down along the reservoir to get away from the, the overwhelming numbers of Chinese, we were sent out on an armed reconnaissance mission. And during this few days, the concentration was either on uh, close air support or on reconnaissance. The way the squadron was organized tactically, Jesse and I flew in the same flight. This doesn't mean that neither one of us would not fly if the other one didn't fly. It's just that in the normal scheduling, uh, Jesse and I would be in the same flight. So Jesse had had a whole year of flying experience before me so that he was what they call a section leader, and I was his wingman. As I remember, we took off about 1.30 in the afternoon, and so it was within an hour of the time that we took off. And uh, Jesse then called out, I'm losing oil pressure, I think I'm... I'm losing my engine. So right away, we were looking around to see where he could could land to help him while he was frantically trying to get the aircraft started or whatever. We were flying over the scrub pine, and somebody saw a space which would have been within a gliding distance. And, uh, Jesse went in there and without any power, because by this time his engine had quit, landed on this slope and hit the ground with such uh, force that the air aircraft fuselage buckled in the cockpit. And he landed wheels up. His canopy was uh, open before he hit the ground. As soon as he hit on the ground, the, the flight leader, who happened to be the squadron executive officer, shifted frequencies to call for help to probably put out a mayday, which we didn't hear flight leader called back and said, we've got an acknowledgement, they're going to send a helicopter up. There was smoke blowing back from under the cowling of the aircraft, and there was great concern as to whether this might burst out in a flame before they could get the helicopters there. I could just see that airplane bursting into flame, 
Jesse was very much alive, and I thought it was uh, it was a risk worth taking to land close to his airplane, pull him out of the cockpit, and wait for the helicopter. You know, I also think about the Medal of Honor ceremony, and, and it was during that interaction when when Daisy learned that uh, that Jesse was in fact alive when my dad got to him there on the mountainside. And so, um, as I understand it, she had been told that uh, that Jesse had died either on impact or 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 shortly thereafter. And and uh, again, it was her understanding that that. Jesse was in fact no longer alive when my dad got to him, and so when my dad told Daisy that, um, you know, he was telling her there in the Rose Garden, saying how um, calm Jesse was when, and how Jesse was giving him comfort, um, you know, giving my dad comfort, and and I guess Daisy sort of stopped him and and you know, so what do you, what do you mean? Uh, and he further explained, and, and again, that's when when he said, um, when she she told him that she she had been told that that he was dead when when my dad arrived, and he described that they were together for, you know, more than an hour, that they were that they were talking, that they were trying to work through this, you know, really difficult situation, and and the story the the circumstances were that Jesse's leg was pinned in by the. Uh, by the fuselage which had buckled on impact and so my dad couldn't physically get him out of the plane. That's when he shared with her, he said, and this is another part of the story that I just find amazing, um, you know, that he, he told her then that uh, Jesse's last words were, tell Daisy I love her. You know, he was very fortunate to have been alive for for so much of the construction period, um, you know, of the ship. For him to be able to visit Bath Ironworks while the ship was under construction, meet so many of the, the men and women who were physically bringing the ship to life, I mean, that was incredible. And likewise, he did have uh, a number of opportunities to meet, um, you know, the men and women who were, who were becoming, you know, part of the crew of the ship. That too was, uh, you know, sort of gave me chills just observing it from, you know, six feet away, just watching those interactions. To him, young men, men and women who were, uh, who were going to be serving aboard his namesake ship. I mean, I think the whole thing was pretty surreal um, for him. And I mean, I certainly feel that they are embracing, you know, his spirit and his spirit of selfless service and and. Um, you know, service to our country, service to the Navy, service to their fellow sailors, uh, and and I think all of those things do live on in, in the spirit of the ship. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Welcome to historic Boston and the commissioning of United States ship Thomas Hudner. I am Commander Brett Litchfield, the ship's executive officer. It is my privilege to be your master of ceremonies today. Before our ceremony begins, please silence your cell phones. We would like to recognize Massachusetts native Sergeant First Class Eric Michael Amand who paid the ultimate sacrifice on November 27th while serving with Army Special Forces in Ghazni Province, Afghanistan. Sergeant Iman was a hero at home and abroad and was key in helping establish the Massachusetts Fallen Heroes Memorial in the Seaport District. Please join us in a moment of silence. Thank you. 
We are here today to celebrate the commissioning of USS Thomas Hudner. The ship before you was christened in Bath, Maine on April 1, 2017. Today she is complete, and this crew is proud to serve on the newest destroyer in the United States Navy. Our crew is dedicated to carrying out the courageous legacy handed down to us by her namesake, Massachusetts native and Medal of Honor recipient, Captain Thomas Hudner, Jr. To quote then Lieutenant Junior Grade Hudner's Medal of Honor citation, while attempting to rescue a squadron mate whose plane struck by anti-aircraft fire and trailing smoke was forced down behind enemy lines, quickly maneuvering to circle the downed pilot and protect him from enemy troops infesting the area, Lieutenant J.G. Hudner risked his life to save the injured flyer who was trapped alive in the burning wreckage. Fully aware of the extreme danger in landing on the rough mountainous terrain and the scant hope of escape or survival in sub-zero temperature, he put his plane down skillfully in the deliberate wheels-up landing in the presence of enemy troops. With his bare hands, he packed the fuselage with snow to keep the flames away from the pilot and struggled to pull him free. Unsuccessful in this, he returned to his crashed aircraft and radioed other airborne planes, requesting that a helicopter be dispatched with axe and fire extinguisher. He then remained on the spot despite the continuing danger from enemy action and with the assistance of the rescue pilot, renewed a desperate but unavailing battle against time, cold, and flames. Lieutenant J.G. Hudner's exceptionally valiant action and selfless devotion to a shipmate sustained and enhanced the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. In that same spirit, this ship will sail the oceans, often alone, and will stand vigilant against those who would threaten democracy and freedom. This crew is honored to serve in the ship which bears his name. Our ceremony today is a time-honored tradition which began with the commissioning of our first warship in 1775. Since then, thousands of ships have undergone the transformation from silent hulls to fully alive warships. Our commissioning crew, hereafter known as plank owners, are in formation among you and ready to bring our ship to life. In just a few moments, the United States Navy Band Northeast Concord Independent Saluting Battery and the Massachusetts Army National Guard Howitzers will render honors to the Honorable Charlie Baker. Will the guests please rise and remain standing for the arrival of our official party, honors, presentation of colors, and the invocation. Ladies and gentlemen, our platform guests. Commander David Shirk, Chaplain Corps, United States Navy. Captain Thomas Hennessy, United States Navy, retired chairman, USS Thomas Hudner Commissioning Committee. Mr. Jim Sheridan, Vice President and General Manager, Lockheed Martin Rotary and Mission Systems. Captain Casey Moten, United States Navy, DDG 51 Class Program Manager. Captain Joseph Toot, United States Navy, Supervisor of Shipbuilding, Bath, Maine. Captain Richard Meyer, United States Navy, Deputy Commodore, Naval Surface Squadron, 14. Miss Jessica Knight Henry, granddaughter to Ensign Jesse Brown. Mr. Ed Kenyon, DDG 51 Class Program Manager, General Dynamics, Bath Iron Works. Mr. Thomas Hudner III, son of Captain Thomas Hudner Jr. Rear Admiral William Galenis, United States Navy, Program Executive Officer, Ships. Vice Admiral Richard Brown, United States Navy, Commander, Naval Surface Forces, Naval Surface Force, U.S. Pacific Fleet. Admiral William Moran, Vice Chief of Naval Operations. The Honorable Marty Walsh, Mayor, City of Boston. General Joseph F. Dunford, United States Marine Corps, Chairman, Joint Chiefs of Staff.
the Honorable Richard B. Spencer, Secretary of the Navy. The Honorable Stephen Lynch, United States Representative, Massachusetts, 8th District. Mrs. Georgia Hudner and Mrs. Barbara Miller, our ship sponsors, escorted today by Command Master Chief Catherine Coleman. The Honorable Charlie Baker, escorted today by Commander Nathan Sherry, United States Navy, Thomas Hunter's commanding officer. Ladies and gentlemen, honors to the Honorable Charlie Baker. Platform and salute.
Constitution Color Guard for their support this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, Chaplain Shirk will deliver the invocation. Let us pray. Most gracious and holy creator, we bow before your throne seeking your blessing upon what we undertake this morning, the commissioning of the destroyer USS Thomas Hudner. As we stand in the shadows of the USS Constitution, we marvel at the technological evolution of our fine Navy. We must recognize the gifted minds that conceived the technology employed upon the plans of this ship. We also recognize the many hands and laborers that took those plans and forged the steel into the mighty vessel we see before us, so different from yesteryear. What has stayed consistent over the years is the commitment and dedication of the sailors that serve aboard, still is committed, still is dedicated. For it is not the technology, plans, or steel that gives the ship life. It is the captain and the crew that serves as the master and the caretakers that bring a ship alive. And so we ask a special blessing to be upon those who will serve aboard the USS Hudner from its very genesis to the twilight of her life. In every voyage and every deployment, may it seek to live out the ethos of this great nation, our Navy, and the namesake of this ship, Captain Thomas Hudner, as he downed his aircraft to save another, that all men are created equal. Father, we pray this ship first be a statement of our desire for peace long before it must be used as a weapon of war. In this we pray in your name. Amen. Will the guests please be seated. Ship's company, who read, rests. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Marty Walsh. Thank you everyone for being here today. To Ms. Hudner, Ms. Miller, Governor Baker, Congressman Lynch, the family of the Hudner family, Jesse Brown, Secretary Spencer, General Dunford, flag officers and general officers, Commander Sherry, military service members and veterans, distinguished guests, it's my profound honor to welcome you to the city of Boston for the commissioning of the USS Thomas Hudner. This is a day with great pride for the city of Boston. As we gather here on Boston Harbor, one of the birthplaces of the American Revolution, one of the iconic places in the American naval tradition, we are here to bear witness to the strength of this tradition, the values it's built on, and the people who embody it today. We are standing now in South Boston. This was a Navy shipyard for much of the 21st, 20th century. The Charlestown Navy Yard across the harbor remains home to the USS Constitution, the world's oldest naval ship afloat. And thousands of men and women from our neighborhoods have served their country with pride and passion over the years down to this very day. I encourage all of you while you're in Boston to visit the Massachusetts Fallen Heroes Memorial right down the Harbor Walk in South Boston Seaport. One of its creators was Sergeant First Class Eric Michael Emmond of the United States Army who returned to duty after recovering from a combat wound and lost his life with two others in Afghanistan on Tuesday. We pray for his family and for those he served with. And we stand in awe once again at the sacrifice of every single service member and every single military family that makes for our country. I want to publicly thank the crew of the USS Tom Hudner for your commitment that you have made to serve. And I want to thank the Hudner family for sharing an American hero and a Medal of Honor recipient with us. Captain Hudner's historic acts and life of service embodies the teamwork, duty, and courage that makes our military great and our country strong. 
I also want to recognize the family of Jesse Brown and thank them for their sacrifice to our beautiful country. The values of these two men and so many other are the values that we need to rely on if we want to meet the challenges in the 21st century. I am immensely proud today in Boston that we can continue this tradition. We can amplify these values through the commissioning of the USS Thomas Hudner. I thank you once again for this honor. God bless all of you, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you, Mayor Walsh. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ed Kenyon. Distinguished guests, Commander Sherry and crew, family and friends, it's my privilege this morning to represent the 6,000 men and women at Bath Ironworks at this commissioning ceremony. Long before we became a nation, people were building ships along the Kennebec River in Maine. Shipbuilding is a Maine heritage that goes back now over 400 years. And during those centuries, the ships that were built in Bath, Maine, developed a reputation around the world for their quality. Sailors that served aboard these ships coined the phrase, Bath built is best built. At Bath Ironworks, we've been building ships for over 130 years, and we recognize that we are the latest chapter in that legacy and strive every day to be worthy of that reputation by focusing on safety, quality, schedule adherence, and controlling our cost. This ship, DDG-116 is the 36th ship of the Arleigh Burke class of destroyers built in Bath. It represents hundreds of thousands of hours of engineering, design, planning, material procurement, tons of steel to be fit and welded, miles of pipe, ventilation, cable, insulation, thousands of gallons of paint, and a robust test and activation team to produce this magnificent ship that we are proud to present as Bath Built. With me this morning are some of my shipbuilding teammates. So on behalf of all the men and women that have handcrafted this magnificent ship, I would please ask the members of Bath Iron Works and the supervisor of shipbuilding in Bath to please stand. In closing, I'd like to speak directly to the crew and remind you of the message I shared in June on the day that we delivered the ship to the Navy and you moved aboard. When the day comes for this Thomas Hudner to go into harm's way, go boldly. This ship will not fail to answer the call because it's bath built. Godspeed to the men and women of the USS Thomas Hudner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kenyon. Ladies and gentlemen, Admiral William Moran. Well, good morning, Boston. Great to see so many of you out here today to pay tribute to the skill that was just described to the shipbuilders and the shipworkers who put this wonderful ship together. Uh, but Governor Baker, Secretary Spencer, and Chairman Dumford, ship sponsors, the entire commissioning committee and Mayor Walsh, but most of all to the citizens of Boston and indeed all of the greater New England area from Kinnebunkport to, to uh, Fall River, thank you for hosting this event today here. You know, there is nothing more fitting than commissioning your Navy's newest warship right here, right now. A ship that, like a certain trumpet, of the greatest generation sounds the call to freedom and for responsibility of Americans to lead both through calm and crisis, no matter the odds, no matter what comes our way. Throughout our young nation's history, we've been blessed with providence with leaders and statesmen who through their optimism and courage bridge the depths of the unknown. This American warship bears the name of the, one of those leaders in Thomas Hudner. And of course, his fellow naval aviator, 
our dear President George Herbert Walker Bush, who slipped the surly bonds of Earth a mere hour ago, many hours ago, only to join his wingmen. Like so many of the bloodlines here today, they left the promises of their fathers, a New England home, college, loved ones, bright careers, to eagerly defend the greater promise of America and all it would mean for the hopes of the world. In the words of our president at the close of the Cold War, and I quote, as I look to the future, I feel strongly about the role of the United States and the, and the role it should play in the new world before us. We have a disproportionate responsibility to use our power in pursuit of the common good. We also have an obligation to lead. And that is what this ship, her crew, and the spirit of Thomas Hudner are all about. It will serve as an instrument of good and a beacon of solidarity with our partners and allies around the world. This, my friends, is what American sea power is all about, to keep America safe and the world's seas free and open. And that is what leaders like President Bush and Thomas Hudner lived for, fought for, and left to us today. The obligation to serve, the obligation to lead. So on behalf of them and of all the 600,000 sailors, civilians throughout the United States Navy, God bless this wonderful town of Boston Mayor for hosting a spectacular event. But most of all, God bless the Hudner family and the family of our 41st president. God bless this great ship and the crew you're about to see bring her to life. And God bless the United States of America and a great land we call freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Admiral Moran. Ladies and gentlemen, General Joseph Dunford. Ladies and gentlemen, it's truly an honor to be here this morning, and I'm particularly humbled to be here with our Medal of Honor recipients, Governor Baker, the Mayor, Congressman Lynch, distinguished leaders from Massachusetts, and most importantly, the Hudner and the Brown families. I join Secretary Spencer, Admiral Moran, and the other leaders on stage in representing your men and women in uniform. As we conduct this ceremony, 275,000 of your soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines are operating around the world in 177 different countries. And as you know, many of them are in harm's way. I'd ask you to keep them in your thoughts and prayers, as well as the families of those we lost last weekend. I'm also here as the son of a Marine who was on the ground fighting at the Chosen Reservoir. On 4 December 1950, Ensign Brown and Lieutenant Hudner were supporting my father and his fellow Marines. And finally, I'm here as someone who had the privilege of spending time with Captain Hudner at events over the course of 30 years. I first met him in the late 1980s, and I can clearly remember the encounter. Someone pointed out Captain Hudner to me, and he gave me his background. And I immediately went over and waited in line, hoping just to shake the hand of a true American hero. And given the line, I expected just to have a quick reading and then to move on. But as we shook hands, Captain Hudner looked me in the eyes. He asked me about my, my assignment. He asked me about my Marines and sailors. He took the time to be engaged. In that initial engagement, I was struck by Captain Thomas Hudner's courtesy and his humility. And in later engagements, I gained an appreciation for his commitment to service and his character. I'd also learned how he viewed his Medal of Honor. In his own words, he viewed the medal less as an honorific than as an obligation, an obligation to use the platform it brought him to bring attention to all those who served and sacrificed. So I have a brief and a simple message today, and it's for the captain and the crew. We've named this ship the Hudner in honor of Captain Thomas Hudner's actions on 4 December 1950, and I know you'll ensure that future generations of young sailors are inspired by his courage. But don't let Captain Hudner's legacy be reduced to just one incident, no matter how heroic. This ship should sustain the memory of Captain Hudner's three decades of naval service and his continued public service after taking off the uniform. This ship should honor the memory of a humble servant leader 
a loving family man, and a man of character. This ship should sustain the memory of a life well led. Thank you, Semper Fidelis, and to the crew of the USS Thomas Udner, fair winds and following seas. Thank you, General Dunford. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Stephen Lynch. Good morning. Thank you, Commander of Litchfield, for the kind introduction, and thank you all for being here today. Governor Baker, Mayor Walsh, all of my colleagues in government, members of the Massachusetts Senate and state representative, uh, thank you for being here. Ambassador Ray Flynn, I'd also like to thank Chaplain David Shirk, Coast Guard Detachment Boston, for his blessing this morning, as well as the Hudner and Brown families, and the many Congressional Medal of Honor recipients who are here with us today. It is a special privilege for me today to welcome and stand at this dais with General Joseph Dunford, the highest ranking military officer in the United States military today as head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a son of South Boston, and as a representative of South Boston and someone who worked in this port, I want to say what an honor it is to have you with us here today. I first met General Dunford in Iraq when he was a lieutenant general at CENTCOM. I met him again about nine months later in Afghanistan. He had been appointed commander of ISAF, the International Security Assistance Force. And then I met him again about 14 months later in Washington, D.C. at the Rayburn Building. And I was told that he had just been appointed Commandant of the Marine Corps. It was at that point I realized that Joe was having trouble holding down a steady job. <laughs> so I am extremely happy that he has remained in his current position as head of our Joint Chiefs of Staff. And again, I think I speak for the Congress in general, Democrat and Republican that we are deeply grateful for General Dunford's thoughtful and stabilizing influence that he and Secretary Mattis and Secretary Spencer have all brought to our military affairs during a difficult and dangerous time. Like most of the elected officials in South Boston, principally because of our friend Tom Lyons, I've had the honor on many, many occasions to enjoy the company of Tom Hudner. Most frequently on Memorial Day, as you might expect, and Veterans Day are one of the many events that Tom Lyons has hosted uh, Medal of Honor recipients. Tom Hudner was a total gentleman. He was a class act. He was a humble hero. And if I could be so bold as to offer my opinion, if Captain Hudner were here today, he'd, stay, he'd start off by insisting that we're actually honoring two men here today, Tom Hudner and Jesse Brown, and all those men and women who served with them. For our part, we are here to honor their sacrifice and we are here to try in a small way to pay the debt of a grateful nation to not only recall their heroic actions on the battlefield, but also to give thanks to the power of example that they provided to America in the 1950s and the profound expression of mutual regard as brothers in uniform an example that I pray might guide our society today. In closing, I want to thank Commander Nathan Sherry and his crew aboard the USS Hudner. I had the opportunity as a member of Congress to, on occasion, uh, request that flags be flown over the United States Capitol. 
So I would ask Commander Hutt, excuse me, I would ask Commander Sherry to please step forward. This is to certify the accompanying flag was flown over the United States Capitol at the request of the Honorable Stephen F. Lynch, Member of Congress. This flag was flown over the United States Capitol in recognition of the commissioning of the USS Thomas Hudner, DG-6116, presented to Commander Nathan Sherry, United States Navy, and the crew in honor of Captain Thomas J. Hudner, Jr., Naval Aviator, Medal of Honor recipients for his valiant efforts on April 13, 1951, in attempting to save the life of his squadron mate, Ensign Jesse L. Brown, in the Battle of the Chosin Reservoir during the Korean War. Signed by Stephen Ayers, architect of the Capitol. May God bless our men and women in uniform, no matter where they are deployed, and may God continue to bless these United States of America. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lynch. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Thomas Hunter III. <laughs> Thank you, I needed that. Good morning to singers, guests, family, and friends. On behalf of my late father, Captain Tom Hudner, my mother, Georgia, and our entire family, I extend our very sincere appreciation to everyone here today for joining us for this momentous occasion. My father was a very humble and understated man, one who always deflected praise and attention. So when, when it was announced in 2012 that a United States Navy guided missile destroyer would be named for him, he was overwhelmed and he was, and he was grateful. To be here today, six years later, with this beautiful ship complete, joined by several thousand guests who have come together to celebrate its commissioning, my family and I share my dad's sentiments. We are overwhelmed and we are grateful. As most of you know, my father's Medal of Honor action involved his valiant attempt to save his downwing man, Ensign Jesse Brown, who had been shot down at the area of the Chosen Reservoir in North Korea during a mission in support of U.S. Marines on the ground who were surrounded by Chinese and North Korean soldiers. Jesse Brown was the nation's first African-American naval aviator and a hero in his own right, who had overcome incredible adversity to earn his Navy wings. However, neither the extreme danger a rescue attempt represented nor the color of Jesse's skin were factors in Dad's decision to crash land to try to save Jesse. Jesse was a friend and squadron mate who needed help, so Dad went in. While many of us would say that was an extraordinary act, my father never thought of himself or that action as extraordinary. To the contrary, when he was asked through the years why he did it, he responded simply that it was the right thing to do, and if he hadn't done it, someone else would have. The ship's commanding officer, Captain Thomas Sisson, did feel that it was an extraordinary act. And when he recommended my father for the Congressional Medal of Honor, he wrote, quote, there's been no finer act of unselfish heroism in military history. Now, as the men and women here today know as well as anyone, throughout military history, there have been countless incredible acts of unselfish heroism. In fact, the history of the United States has been built upon these acts, many of which went unseen and without recognition. But it was Captain Hudner's unselfish act in the service of his country, the United States Navy, and his friend and squadron mate that lives in the spirit of this ship. Three days from now, December 4th, will mark 68 years since that action in North Korea. It will also mark 68 years since Jesse Brown's passing. Had he survived, he too would have surely continued to lead a life that was characterized by his own selfless service to his country, his family, and others whom, we, whom he would have encountered and inspired. We remember Jesse today and every day, and we are honored to have so many members of Jesse's family with us here for this event. Their support and friendship mean so much to our family, and I know that Dad and Jesse would be so pleased to know that the bond that they formed as friends and squadron mates more than 68 years ago 
continues through our families today. While we regret that my father did not live to witness today's event, we will be forever grateful that he was alive to see and participate in the evolution of the ship's development from the naming ceremony here in Boston in 2012 to the christening last year in Bath, Maine. It was a thrill for him to have the opportunity to visit Bath Ironworks many times and to meet and to thank the men and women who were bringing his namesake ship to life, whose great skill and dedication carry on the legacy of Bath Built is Best Built. Today we extend our deep gratitude to the Commissioning Committee who have provided countless hours of work and an abundance of care over the past four years to plan and execute today's event and the activities leading up to it. Many of those men and women shared a personal friendship with my father, and I know that those bonds have infused and inspired their incredible efforts, and we are so grateful. We also thank all of our service men and women, active duty and retired, the countless men and women who have served in the armed forces throughout our country's history, and we pay special tribute to those who have made the ultimate sacrifice, those like Jesse Brown. We thank all of these men and women for their service, and we vow to never forget their sacrifices to protect our freedom and the freedom of others. A particular highlight for my father and for our entire family has been the connection he shared and that we share with the ship's crew. Under Commander Sherry's leadership, the crew made personal connections with my father when he was alive, and as much as they were pleased to have the opportunity to meet with him, he was just as excited to spend time with them. My father's pride in the Navy was beyond measure, and the men and women of the crew of the USS Thomas Hudner exemplified for him the characteristics of leadership, dedication, and selfless service. As a family, we feel truly honored to know the crew. We share his pride in you, and we are so grateful that you are, you are serving aboard this great ship. Some of the most memorable experiences I had with Dad were to be at an event or gathering, perhaps just a few steps away, and to witness the way in which people responded to him and his story, and to hear them express what his story meant to them, and to see the way in which Dad would engage with those people with unfailing grace, interest, and humility. While it was often my dad's naval career or Medal of Honor action that initially drew people to him, it was his inherent characteristics of respect, empathy, modesty, and humor, and always placing the needs of others above his own that led to deep and lasting friendships with so many. As a family, we are so humbled and honored to participate in today's event and to celebrate our country, the United States Navy, and the commissioning of the USS Thomas Hudner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hudner. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Richard Spencer. Medal of Honor recipients, Tuskegee Airmen, uniform members of our services, veterans, Governor Baker, Congressman Lynch, General Dunford, Admiral Moran, the Honorable Ray Mavis, who is the naming authority for this ship. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for inviting me here today to share in this great event. To the family of the Thomas Hudner, thank you for honoring us with your presence today. I'd be remiss if I also didn't thank Captain Tom Hennessy for his amazing job here in the commissioning exercise that we've had, elegant and exquisite. I also want to thank the uniform members, the civilian and contracting team that delivered the Thomas Hudner here today. Ladies and gentlemen, we continually hear a thump that our U.S. government is broken. Please avert your eyes to the man of war in front of you. This ship, whose mission is peace through presence, but with its warrior team, is able to deliver the fight tonight, is out there on your behalf as the forward deployed team. I'd be remiss if I also didn't say that the Commonwealth lost a son last night, and the United States lost a diplomat and a career servant to this country our 41st President, 
George Herbert Walker Bush, may we keep the family in our memories. Two months ago, it was my honor to speak at the Medal of Honor Society at their annual convivium. A greater collection of heroes and patriots probably could never be found. But what made that gathering very special and very particular was that it was on the grounds of the United States Naval Academy. Just steps away was the next generation of patriots studying for their midterm exams. It reminded me of the unbroken chain that Thomas Hudner embodied throughout his whole life. From the moment his service began at the United States uh, military, I beg your pardon, Naval Academy, to the day he earned the Medal of Honor. The day he earned the Medal of Honor and think that what he did, crash landed his ship next to his wingman and shipmate, Jesse Brown. He spent a lifetime looking out for his shipmates after that. And his spirit will live on, ladies and gentlemen, in the proud service of every man and woman aboard this destroyer we commission today. The USS Thomas Hudner is proof of what teamwork of all our people can do, all we can accomplish together. A special tip of my hat to the workers at Bath Ironwork. Bath built, best built. It remains the saying today. I also want to extend a special word of thank to the plank owners and officers and crew of the USS Thomas Hudner and their families. We all know the men and women wearing navy blue can't get to where they are without the support of their families. I know the extreme demands that sea service can put on both the sailor and the family. And I stand with you and with all the gratitude of a nation for your service. Understand that as you take to sea, know that all of you are backed by the Department of the Navy, the Department of Defense that sails with you, as does a very grateful nation. And now it's my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce the keynote speaker, a distinguished leader, a dedicated public servant, who, by the way, just got his commission to serve another round of command tour of his own the Governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Charlie Baker. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. And let me just begin by thanking all of you, all of you who came out today to celebrate this glorious and joyous event. I also want to thank the Commissioning Committee the folks at Bath Ironworks, the Navy, our elected and appointed officials who are here with us today, and our men and women in uniform. But I want to start in particular by recognizing the crew of this magnificent vessel. They've been in Maine for the past two years, while their families have remained home across the country. I want to thank you and your families for your dedication, your sacrifice, and your service to this country. You know, I had the pleasure of working with Tom Hudner for almost a decade in the 1990s when he was the Commissioner of Veterans Services here in Massachusetts. You, the members of this crew, should be proud to operate a ship named after such a special man. Simply put, and you've heard a bit about this today, it was never about Tom Hudner. He was the consummate team player, and the only way you would have known anything about what took place on that mountaintop during the Korean War would have been to have heard about it from somebody else or to read about it, because he never talked about it. In fact, when he was asked back in the day to talk about a picture, at which point President Truman was placing the Medal of Honor around his neck, Tom changed the subject. 
He said, you know, it had been a couple of days after President Truman had fired General MacArthur, and the President had received a lot of criticism. So we're on the Rose Garden steps, and Daisy Brown, the widow of Jesse Brown, the fellow I tried to pull out of his airplane, was there, escorted by a black Navy lieutenant. After he put the medal around my neck, the President started to leave, and as he turned around on those Rose Garden steps, he stumbled, and the lieutenant caught him before he fell. Now, I don't think he would have fallen on his face, but still, the lieutenant looks at him and says, well, Mr. President, I hope you know that somebody here is still supporting you. Real heroes are humble. They don't talk about themselves. They talk about and encourage others. They say thank you. They pump up their teammates their family, their friends, and they view their own decisions, whatever they might be, as nothing special. On December 4, 1950, almost 68 years ago to the day from today, Tom dissipated a direct order and crashed his plane on a snow-covered mountaintop in 15-degree weather to try to save his friend and fellow airman, Jesse Brown. It was an act of bravery and sacrifice that bordered on the edge of recklessness. But Tom didn't see it that way. Jesse was alive, and it looked as if he needed nothing except a good tug to get him out of that airplane. I just didn't think very much about hurting myself. I just felt that, for what it was, it was worth taking the chance. So matter of fact, so focused on his friend, so understated and unassuming, so Tom Hudner. Some years later, Tom said his first thought when he crash landed the plane was something like, God, what the hell am I doing here? Just climbing up the snowy, slippery slope and then finding a way to look into the cockpit of Jesse Brown's plane and reach out to him was work. He couldn't create the leverage he needed to pull him out, and given the damage to the cockpit, it's not clear he would have been able to haul him out even if he'd had the leverage to make a go of it. Still, he stayed with Jesse talked about the situation they were facing together and tried a variety of approaches to set him free. Eventually, after about 45 minutes, a rescue helicopter showed up, and Tom had no choice but to leave with the copter, hoping to come back later to extract his friend with better equipment. Alas, the weather and the enemy made the return trip impossible. But Tom never forgot Jesse's widow or his family. And in fact, he paid for Desi Daisy's post-war college education with his discharge bonus and stayed close to her and to her family throughout Daisy's life. And he said many times that he thought about Jesse Brown every single day for the rest of his life. And like almost every member of the military I've ever met, Tom didn't think what he did was particularly special. In one interview, he said the men he served with would do anything for one another. Another time, he said, you know, I wrecked an airplane and I didn't even get the guy out of the wreckage. I happen to be an aviator, but an infantryman who cannot dig deep enough or fast enough to get away from enemy gunfire will still jump up at the first sign of trouble to pull a buddy to safety. It's an attitude that is latent for the most part in normal life, but comes out when you're suddenly confronted with life and death in a situation like that. 
After Tom's passing, the Boston Globe wrote an obituary that noted that Tom spent much of his time talking about his wingmate, Jesse Brown, when this ship was christened in Maine two years ago. Tom said Jesse was loyal to Daisy, loyal to his squadron, loyal to the Navy service, and in return, people were very loyal to him. That's because Tom never thought it was all about him. He led by example and brought a steely sense of purpose and dignity to everything he did. It is my fervent hope that this ship is imbued with the humility, the selflessness, the patriotism, the commitment to one another, and the kindness and decency that transcends our differences that made Tom so special. Godspeed and safe seas to the crew to the USS Thomas Hudner. God bless the Commonwealth. God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Baker. Secretary Spencer, I would be honored if you would now place Thomas Sudner in commission. For the President of the United States, I hereby place the United States ship Thomas Hudner in commission. May God bless her and guide this warship and all that sail in her. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Executive Officer, hoist the colors and the commission pennant. Aye, sir. Thomas Hudner, that's in. Hut. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. I direct your attention to the ship's mast as we hoist the colors and the commission pennant. Quartermaster, hoist the colors and the commission pennant. says Thomas Hudner. Very well. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. I will now read my orders from Commander, Naval Military Personnel Command, to Commander Nathan Sherry, United States Navy. Subject, Buford's Orders 1085 of 17 April 2015. When directed by reporting senior, detach in June 2015 from present duty and report to pre-commissioning unit Thomas Hudner, DDG 116, as commanding officer. Upon commissioning of USS Thomas Hudner, report for duty as commanding officer. Admiral Moran, United States ship Thomas Hudner is in commission and I am in command. Executive officer, set the watch. Aye, sir. Officer the deck, set the first watch. Aye, sir. The officer of the deck is the commanding officer's direct representative and while on watch is responsible for the safe operation of the ship and crew. The long glass is the traditional symbol of an officer of the deck's authority in the ship of the line. We are pleased to have Miss Jessica Knight Henry and Mr. Thomas Hunter III in attendance. They will pass the long glass to Chief Warrant Officer Joshua Danson from Crossfield, Tennessee, our first officer of the deck. The Petty Officer of the Watch is Fire Controlman First Class Vincent Muniz from Bronx, New York. The Messenger of the Watch is Quartermaster Seaman Angela Munoz from Pecos, Texas. And the Boatswain's Mate of the Watch is Boatswain's Mate Third Class Jerron Hancock from Cleveland, Ohio.
set the watch. On deck, section one. Sir, the watch is set. Very well. Captain, the watch is set. Very well. We are delighted to have our sponsors, Mrs. Georgia Hudner and Mrs. Barbara Miller, with us today. Georgia and Barbara christened this ship in Bath, Maine, in April 2017. Ladies, I would be honored if you would join me and give the order to man our ship and bring her to life. Officers and crew of the USS Thomas Hudner, man our ship and bring her to life. Center salutes you.
are proud to serve in your great Navy. Ready? Two. Will the guests please be seated? No aircraft. <laughs> Captain USS Thomas Hudner is manned and ready. Very well. Vice Admiral Brown. USS Thomas Sudner is manned and ready and reports for duty, sir. Very well, sir. Secretary Spencer, request permission to break your flag, sir. Very well. Executive Officer, break the flag of the Secretary of the Navy. Aye, sir. Quartermaster, break the flag of the Secretary of the Navy. Aye, aye sir. Captain, the flag of the Secretary of the Navy is flying over USS Thomas Hedner. That was for you, Mr. Secretary. Ladies and gentlemen, Commander Nathan Sherry, United States Navy, Commanding Officer, United States Ship Thomas Hedner. Thomas Hedner, parade, rest. Mrs. Barbara Joan Miller, Mrs. Georgia Hudner and family, Mrs. Pamela Brown Knight and family, Governor Baker, Mayor Walsh, Secretary Spencer, General Dunford, Admiral Moran, Vice Admiral Brown, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. For Captain Tom Hudner, it was about family. I would like to start by taking this opportunity today to talk about my family. Help me recognize my wife, Rosa, and three of our four children here today, Nathan Jr., Michaela, Elizabeth. Rosa is the foundation of our family and strong as steel. Together, Rosa and I owe a debt of gratitude to her mother, Neela, who has contributed so much to ensuring that what we continue to build together remains strong. Today, we come together as a family to celebrate our ship's namesake, Captain Thomas J. Hedner, Jr., who on 4 December 1950 violently and intentionally crash landed his own plane to save his element leader, his friend, and his shipmate, Ensign Jesse Brown. Today, we come together as a family to honor the character of the man for whom this ship is named. It is through his character that he was able to defy what was once the core elements of a society that continually wronged people who were not like the majority they lived with. It is through his character that upon ending 27 years of naval service, he then served our veterans in the great city of Boston for another four decades. Today, we come together as a family to remember Captain Hudner for what he left behind and continue to build a legacy of better American citizens who show more concern for their brother, sister, friend, or neighbor than the concern they have for themselves. A legacy where we understand and endeavor to better ourselves and those around us and help those soldiers, airmen, Marines, and sailors that have gone before us to serve our great nation and put themselves in harm's way to defend values, beliefs, and ideals for which this country stands for and for which they believed in so strongly that they risked their lives defending them. As we celebrate our ship coming to life and entering into naval service, we endeavor as a crew to be better human beings. As we celebrate, we endeavor as a crew to serve honorably. And as we celebrate, we look forward to the day where we might be tested and even find ourselves in a predicament, as he was, where we will do what it takes without hesitation. Despite the odds, despite the orders, despite barriers in society, to save our brothers and sisters who are themselves in harm's way. We look forward to the day where we too can be like our ship's namesake, like Captain Hudner. 
Before you stand 312 of America's finest sons and daughters from 46 different states, as well as several countries around the world with over 2,288 years of combined experience that have chosen to serve their country and continue to fight for what believe in as a nation. I can't begin to tell you how proud I am of this crew and what they have accomplished over the last three years, watching the ship come together in Bath Iron Works, heading out to sea on sister ships for training and experience, and spending countless hours carrying out tasks required to bring this mighty warship we now call USS Thomas Edna to life. Ladies and gentlemen, please give them a round of applause and recognition for their hard work, dedication, and service to this great nation. Begin to tell you how great we're, how grateful we are as a crew for how well this ship is built and for all the support we have received to make this day happen. Our sincere and heartfelt thanks to the Thomas Hudner family for welcoming us into their family. Fall Rivers Andover Academy and the U.S. Naval Academy class of 1947, who helped forge Captain Hudner's character during his early adult formative years. The shipbuilders in Bath, Maine who poured their heart and soul to build it right from the start. The Supervisor Shipbuilding Bath Team, who so graciously welcomed us into their community and provided so much assistance, guidance, and training. The Fleet Integration Team, for passing on tribal knowledge and assistance in crew training, as well as helping to build a solid foundation for all of our ship's program. The PMS 339 team for not only the daily assistance with pre-com challenges, but also ensuring that these lessons learned are passed down to the next hull so that their transition to a new construction ship is a path well marked. The missioning committee for putting so much energy and hard work to take care of my crew and come to Captain Hudner's family. To the great city of Boston for hosting us here. To the great state of Massachusetts for being home to our national hero, Captain Thomas Hudner, who we have the privilege to celebrate today by breathing life into a ship named in his honor. And finally, to all who contributed to making this day a reality, again, thank you. If Captain Hudner were here today, I would tell him that while we could never fully live up to the standard he set in his 67 years of service to our nation and our nation's veterans, we will embody and carry forward his legacy through his ship that now bears his name. We will honor and remember Tom by always forging our way forward, helping each other out, and working as a cohesive team, believing in the concept of family and taking care of each other, and always putting our shipmates' well-being above our own. We will always live up to our motto of above all others. Thank you. Ship's company, Hudson in. Hut. Will the guests please rise? Chaplain Shirk will now lead us in the benediction. A sailor's prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I'm just a sailor, a protector of the land.
the chair. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated and remain seated for the.